I V M. This is Audio Gyan, and I am your host Kedar Nimkar. Welcome to a deep dive into the minds of luminaries from the Indian creative world. Prati means edition in Kannada. Atelier Prati, based in Bangalore, along with tracing print histories and looking at infrastructural innovations in manufacturing, print making equipments, hosts residencies, conducts workshops, curates, and initiates cross disciplinary collaborations. to propose new approaches to ideas in print and off print to discuss this and more today we have jay sima chandrashekhar with us on audio gan he founded atelier prati in bangalore jay has been envisioning a space for print making in bangalore since he graduated from college of fine arts uh, in 2017 welcome jay to audio gan it's a real real pleasure to have you on the show Thank you, Kedar. Likewise, <laughs> superb. So, as I mentioned, I have these three formats: uh, audio gan, uh, regular interviews, case study, and and uh, biographies. In case study, we generally try and deep dive into one problem area, uh, one solution, one project, one sort of one project, and just going deeper into it. So, I I wanted to pick your brains around what is Atelier Prati, how did you form it, uh, and some bits of print making, some history. generally all about print right yeah. so yeah yeah that's that's what the premise is and i wanted to start off by asking what is atelier prati and and why did you form it um well yeah i mean i think probably even before i i mean most of us know what is atelier mean and what is um prati of course i'll have to explain in some time because it's it's rooted in kannada and i'll have to give some explanations to it but uh, yeah the whole idea sparked off or started you know as when i enrolled for an undergraduate program uh, in print making from a very old institute in fact uh, kala mandir school of arts in bangalore it's actually established in 1990 and it recently celebrated 100 years and you know unlike other colleges pioneer there is one which is like the oldest <laughs> you know mm-hmm. i was fortunate enough to be part of that you know institute and to uh, study and learn print making in my undergrad program there but uh, there's a little bit of back history i don't know if i can dig into if we, if we have time <laughs> but yeah sure, a, sure. you know so after my plus 2 which i terribly failed uh, there was a bomb there and uh, so i had no other option and back in the days i think animation was like the big thing and that was sort of like a logical or a rational to get into in life because i was inclined into drawing and design and things like that so somehow i convinced my parents to enroll me for an animation program when i got in there i met a facilitator mr baswacha who is the mentor who sort of opened up a lot of avenues to me he's the one who really you know put me into this whole idea or allowing me to understand there is this specialization or or a practice called print making right so um so when i joined there uh, side by side he said i think you might not fit here very well in animation i think you should try uh, you know having a undergrad degree in fine arts and so that's when it started and i went myself and enrolled for this program in kalamandi school of arts where i my specialization was in print making and uh, Yeah, this is where it started. <laughs> you know, my interest okay. was in making. Ha ha ha. Okay, and um, yeah, I mean, if you can give some bits of like what is Prati in Canada? I started. It means edition, yeah. but if you can just give some backstory of of the name itself, how did it like emerge? Yeah, I mean, see, I think what's very interesting uh, in the title of our space is uh, there's two thing happening one is like the atelier which of course is the word referred to all the studios in france and there was a, a whole you know you if you look at the art history there's a whole plethora of studios and you know the for all atelier 21 atelier you know there are many studios basically it's it's studio and mm. uh, prati in kannada it has multiple uh, meanings or associations so prati is a copy prati is a reflection and prati we also it's also like every time you know a repetitive act so you know it sort of like really made sense for us to use that word and um, it was yeah 
logical and nothing could go more logical than that like you know <laughs> beautiful so, yeah 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 when you say repetition i think i have like to circle back on this when it comes to print making but um, yeah so so if we can start off with um, like giving some little bit of history of printing in india i mean we being always sort of very heavy on the oral tradition uh, i believe the paper came in china in some third century right mm-hmm. uh, it almost took 10 12 years to come to india right and obviously there are different theories and different narratives but uh, maybe we could understand your version of how did it come to india like a little bit of history of printing in india well i think i mean it's it's a very nicely framed question um, but i would also like to add that you know um, when it comes to printing right or the history of printing it is inevitable to look at the history of literacy systems mm. right and it, it's a highly contested space yeah. so i'm not a authority like you know to talk about it in that sense but i have my own version as you rightly put mm-hmm. <laughs> you know puzzling or picking up these larger ideas and you know somehow bringing them together and making your own piece of information yeah, yeah? yeah. but uh, you know i think uh, alongside oral histories there was a very strong lineage of recording things in india right mm-hmm. there's a popular uh, idea that you know we as a as a country as a as a culture i mean of course oral traditions were the you know thing of ours but there were also like things like inscriptions right mm. and there were like uh, you know manuscripts like palm leaf manuscripts and and in fact uh, i think uh, you know the earliest form of print making can be traced back into india if i'm not wrong because block printing has always been there right and it suddenly finds in this whole timeline it gets categorized where paper becomes the quintessential material you know uh, which of course was originated in china and uh, there's a long bit of history to it and i think uh, we might even not make a justice in our no in a session like in a dialogue like this but of mm. course the first ever printed matter in terms of on a paper is been dated to china uh, in in fact more than anything it was a currency right it goes mm. back to song dynasty where they made an attempt to make a currency out of a paper right and i mean they are sitting with this invaluable or or like i don't know how to even you know put it, in, it. Yeah, yeah this material and they come up with an idea of you know printing on it and and making a common thing such as like a currency right it's an radical idea i think you know hmm. so well of course that's there but there is another contested history that paper was made in egypt right and hmm. uh, but it's actually not paper it's papyrus so papyrus is sort of like a woven material and uh, uh, paper is a non woven material you know mm. so in egypt there were there are uh, inscriptions or materials which are made out of papyrus where you take a bark of a plant papyrus and you strip them into pieces uh, there's a chatai you know they make that mat no so it's basically they made those mats and they started you know there were series of people who were inscribing on it and 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 there are these documents which goes back to you know egypt mm. um but in china it's interesting because along with inventing this material as paper because you know it was bound to happen they were already they pioneered with silk and and they were already like working with silk and with mulberry especially mulberry was like the space for uh, you know growing uh, uh, you know silk worms right mm. and uh, there are many stories anecdotes fantastic anecdotes around it like one day a queen was sitting and sipping a tea uh and then uh, suddenly a silk worm fell into her tea and then she realized you know if a worm is put in a hot water you can bring out the entire spool of silk from from the worm right i mean there are stories like that which is you know interconnected there so again going back to my train of thought <laughs> yes it started in china and and it came to india very slowly as a material but uh, there were inscriptions in stone and there were also attempts by uh, uh, buddhist monks who were always on the run right to sort of capture these or or make an impression out of it uh, mm. using these leaves and what not whatever the materials were involved back in the days so that's the part with asia 
right Fair and, and in fact in fact the, yeah. sorry sorry to interrupt but in fact there's one more narrative which i had heard was that um, and i couldn't spot the roots of it but the the tamil script uh, some of the south indian scripts are also in a particular direction and a particular styling just because they used to write on leaves so the veins of the leaf used to dictate or or, or demand a particular way it's supposed to be written so that it doesn't tear the leaf also so i'm sure that writing was be like much more deeper as as we may not perceive it you know what i mean right it's it to be like much more deeper than that well i, I mean you know actually any form of uh, printing hmm. is dependent on the material right correct like even if you go back to uh, if you look at the mokohanga tradition of woodcuts or you know uh, if you go back to japan if you go back to china it's all guided by the material right hmm. so uh, but this narrative of tamil scriptures being you know uh, written in a certain way i think there are spin offs in making a narrative right and uh, back in the days it was a series of people who were sitting and uh, as scribes sitting and writing things on you know material and each one has their own signature by virtue of them like like today we celebrate handwritings so so yeah i mean that was there but it it took a significant role uh, later in the history i think we should also probably look at the european history of printing and what happened there and you know how it came back to india and also end of the day printing is is also a way of colonizing you know uh, mm. so there are many things involved in that got it got it in fact there is one more interesting piece which i heard recently is uh, uh, many times uh, when the the british used to have a conversation uh, since it was oral they couldn't really find a base right in today's day the way we say that google kar mil jayega right वैसे दे वॉज टू से लिखा खाए बताओ लाइक वेर इज इट रिटर्न राइट एंड दैट्स वाई वी वर ऑल्सो कम्पेयर टू राइट टू जस्ट टू प्रूव दैट येस इट हैज गॉट आई मीन इफ इट्स इन विकीपीडिया इट कुड बी ट्रू दैट्स दैट सॉर्ट ऑफ द नाइनटीज और इट लाइक टू थाउजेंड नैरेटिव राइट आई थिंक बैक देन इफ से आई डोंट नो वेदास वॉज जस्ट रिसाइटेड और सम पीस वॉज जस्ट सेड अ लॉट ऑफ कॉलोनाइजेशन डेंट रियली Hold it true. Like they would ask, where is it written? Show us, and that's how like more documentation also started. Is that correct understanding? Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, as I said, this is an uncharted boundary. Like, <laughs> you know. Uh, mm. But in fact, if if I can put a thought there, uh, I think the earliest uh, registered books pertaining to grammar, right? It goes back to India. Uh, you know, there was an attempt to made uh, uh, grammar books for Sanskrit or Tamil. Mm. and you know so for 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 a culture which believe so strong in oral tradition you know and picking up these things and making into a a book format itself is is a is a radical thing quickly adapt and to move and to make certain things yeah 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 the reason why i thought of this is because recently i was in a workshop where this guy uh, the, the speaker said bhatkhande the legendary musician and yeah. right actually like a teacher like everything he went on documenting all the things and then wrote a book because hindustani classical music or carnatic is very much improvisation so mm. they are just tripping on something and he got offended i yeah. think that's one of the story so he said it's not tripping it it has got a framework it has got a grammar it has got everything it is just that the framework is so agile that you can still explore and come back to the main rag so so yeah i mean that that's where true, i thought true, it would be interesting yeah. no i mean another interesting thing is if if we look at the lineage of materials uh, which are involved in print making uh, i'm sorry i mean throughout the conversation i i stress a lot about material and that's Yeah. Know, my practice right hmm. uh, i mean as i said it started with stone and then it slowly morphs into a palm leaf and then there is a sophisticated structure as a cloth and then there is an even more sophisticated structure as a paper right so i think print making historically has it's actually an evolutionary program which has gone in tandem with civilization you know as we discovered materials as we you know started inventing things uh but the basic idea still remains the same you know in in mm. i think uh uh 1600 or 1800 years of history uh it just remains the same the idea is to disseminate knowledge and there's nothing radical uh, which has come into or kicked in in fact for example there's this particular technique called letterpress printing uh 
uh, when it was invented uh, by a German, Johann Gutenberg, not invented, he perfected the technique, right? Uh, hmm. Movable types were already there in China, right? But this fellow sort of rationalized the technique or rationalized the labor, you know, took it back to Europe. And that particular printing technique could never find a parallel for 900, in, uh, you know, years. Wow. And we all our uh, all our knowledge systems are printed in that, you know, at like up until nineteen forties, if I'm not wrong. Hmm. Yeah. If you zoom out that way, is it not saying too much when we say that the inkjet and these sort of dot matrix printers had a really short life now because we are in this digital world yeah. and then like 800, 900 years of like pure material, pink, yeah. uh, whatever, like print and, and ink and oil. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's interesting. I have an interesting story to that. You know what? Please, please. Yeah. If you look at the digital or the inkjet printing, right? Any form of digital printing. And if you look at any form of conventional printing, the quintessential principle is the same. It's a binary system. There is a dot of ink or there is no ink. If you look at into computer, it's one or zero. Mm. So between these extremes, these are the illusions we create, we work with. Like if you look at like an 8-bit system or a 32-bit system or a 16-bit system, it's a multiple of what the binaries, what we are working with, right? Either there is light or there is no light. And in print, either there is ink or there is no ink. And that's the same. We mm-hmm. have uh, such fancy machines which can sort of like perform uh, uh, in microns. And I mean, here's another thing. I think as much as Asia has contributed to print, uh, I think the Germans have done in the same way. right? And, and all the breakthrough inventions in printing technologies are made by Germans. I mean, it's very interesting to look at. If you look at lithography, it's a German you know, uh, a stage playwright who someday accidentally invented this technique. Uh, mm. If you look at uh, letterpress, it's Johann Gutenberg who sort of perfected the technique. So uh, I think Germans have contributed a lot in terms of printing technologies. But, you know, let me not stop myself there. But, uh, what I was trying to attempt was like, if you look at the best machines in, in the world, like the Heidelberg offset machines, right? They perform in such a uh, speed that we can't even comprehend in our real life but they still operate on the same logic there is ink there's no ink you know there's nothing beyond that Hmm. beautiful yeah it it gives a very interesting perspective to look at things yeah i mean you know it but it just like it gives a yeah like a pause to think about it interesting yeah Uh, yeah okay let's take a short break yeah we'll be right back Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. On Think Fast, Varun and Suchita discuss Revlon filing for bankruptcy and Sony Live's success story. On Cyrus says, Cyrus was not there with us this week because he's vacationing in Spain. Ayushi, Sriram, Antriksh and Abbas, however, discuss airline etiquette and gifts they're given to their exes. On The Wire Talks, author Aparna Piramal Raja tells Siddharth how she coped with bipolar disorder. On Press Decode, Sarah Bagda and Prafula take a look at the porn industry. And on Big Talks about Tiny Humans, Devi Shobha and Meghna discuss four major parenting styles. Just a reminder to everybody, the IVM merchandise is now available. You can go to the IVM podcast website and click on the shop tab. Check out our first collection of t-shirts. Also, do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And I'd like to remind you all that it is really, really helpful for us when you do recommend this show or any of our other shows to a friend. Word of mouth is great for us, and it's really a great way for us to grow our audience and have more people for you to discuss your podcast consumptions with. Also, don't forget to rate us on any platform you're listening on, and you can also check us out on YouTube at ivmpodcast.com slash YouTube. We have a list of the YouTube channels we are on. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Cap Gemini, Intel VPro, and Intel Future Banal Wonderful. Thank you so much for making this possible. Okay, welcome back to the show. Yeah, we'll circle back on lithography. We'll, we'll eventually come back, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. you know. I think when you ask that question, probably I think I should also uh, probably slightly assert there's a difference between printing and print making, hmm. and uh, both of it has contributed in its own way. 
right so often what happens is we tend to get lost in or get interchanged in these terminologies what is printing and what is print making right from the day one it's just been printing but print making is a terminology which was picked up later right hmm. for example um, you know so so yeah i mean that was my one of the questions like what is print making for a layman and what are the nuances or like the subtle or evident differences between say print making and and uh, printing yeah so okay i think again we have to go back to the history of printing uh, it could be east or the west you know again it's a contested space but uh, uh, the core idea of anything to do with printing is the dissemination of lo- knowledge right back in the days the availability of the material and the availability of skilled people you know who can deal with a certain material in a certain way was the prerequisite for any sort of you know knowledge dissemination right like if we look at it the first bible which was printed or the first compilation of shakespeare's work which was printed they are in numbers like 200 or 300 you know and and that number you know today it's 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 a joke hmm. but hmm. back in the day it was 200 people who could have this repository of knowledge right so what happened down the lane was uh, when when the techniques got sophisticated there were a lot of people who are involved in it like mm. for example to a very longest period of time there was no idea of an artist print maker you know it was always print maker it was a designation it was a serious craft right and there were like other uh, you know uh, specializations like the stone men who used to like you know what do you call bring in all the letters in letter press printing the types and sort of put them on a stone which is perfectly flat and make sure they're all level they were called stone men so there were these hierarchies in labor mm. right so it was an industry and it is still an industry in fact india is the biggest printing economy in the world right mm. and uh, what i'm saying is it becomes print making when artists embrace the technique and when they started creating their own works right so for example let me just quickly give you an uh, you know whatever a painted image on this if there was a mokohanga artist back in the days he used to paint the design yeah on a paper on a piece of paper and that was given it to the key block maker that was a serious craft it was a trade that guy only used to sit and carve the artist would never sit and carve right so he used to carve and later after this person was carved all these multiple blocks for whatever multiple colors what not and all of that it used to go to a printer so there is a hierarchy within the system right i think this hierarchy largely was broken at the time of uh, german expressionism i mean this is like a historical or a time frame in art history you know what people usually look at but it was right after world war 1 and there was this trauma and there was so much things to say where artists picked up these techniques and they started doing it on their own they no longer wanted to depend on these you know crafts people wow right and then and then it's like a liberation like you know you can you can do whatever you want to do and you can put it out in the real world so i think uh, according to me uh, print making as a term became fortified in in that time in that history in, you know in in that timeline of the history and later a lot of artists picked it up and you know they started experimenting with it they started doing things with it innovations kicked in artists have also contributed significantly as other people or from other walks of life for example if you look at uh, mr krishna reddy uh, who is uh, been acclaimed for inventing this particular technique called viscosity he sort of partner with a, a french printmaker william haters and they both extensively researched and gave us to this real world this technique called viscosity printing right so i think it's it's always like and i mean sometimes it's very poetic like earlier there was no copper it was wood people were making wood cuts later in the day copper as a material was invented people started making dry points and then they borrowed a little bit of uh, you know what do you call them alchemists you know mm. their techniques and they got to know how to etch a copper with acid so they yeah. could achieve finer details in their prints right and and then that's how it, it's a progress and you know i think it's very difficult to sort of look at it in a very linear perspective as mm. a historical time it's i think it, i think it's it's a web <laughs> yeah i can i can 
yeah in fact when you said about how like due to so much sharing or or the 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 drive to share so much they skipped and maybe started doing on their own and that's where till date we are suffering and not having good craftsmen true, <laughs> true, true. yeah so i mean i'm just curious kedar like what what is your idea of print like how do you see print material every day or like what's your opinion about print as <laughs> yeah uh, i don't know yaar like frankly i'm going to come and visit your studio what what my exposure to uh, print making has been very close i've been following anthony barrel uh, uh-huh. for quite some time uh, i happened to meet him at, at design yatra as well mm. so i had a chat with him there's a episode which i did with him so my exposure has been just limited to anthony barrel i had recently gone to to jaipur where i found few blocks of good type design Yeah. Uh, as in like good letter letters yeah. which are carved on on a wood yeah. and i did a bit of lino cut printing but that's pretty much it and i'm i am working on a project uh, <laughs> which i'll definitely talk about after this recording uh, yeah it's yeah. it's fascinating yeah. like it's wonderful to know so many uh, layers to it I mean, see. I mean, it's also after a point, it's very difficult to escape from it because all sorts of information. For example, like before this whole internet boom, right? I think uh, I don't know if you remember there was there's a particular publication. It's called the Collier's Encyclopedia. Hmm. Right? They used hmm. to come up in like twenty one volumes, right? And it's it's like the Google or whatever, like the internet search base, right? Anything you want to know, you you know, people used to go to that encyclopedia. It's all summed up and there are indexes, there are bibliographies attached to it. Everything is in print, right? Yeah. And it's also very interesting that how often we think about a lot of other paraphernalia which is around us, like magazines, film posters, matchboxes you know it can be as simple as like a pataka like a firecracker and you know and an artwork printed on top of it like you know yeah. so it's i mean it's everywhere predominantly everywhere and we cannot escape from it for sure correct correct in fact uh, like if you think of in that axis there has been some records which are maybe like 10 12 14 generations older which are still written in hand by these these uh, people in varanasi and yeah. uh, parts of yeah yeah like matlab yeah. who's your father and then fathers 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 mothers fathers and like just go on till like some 10 15 generations because everyone used to come for the death rituals there so they used to just put and there are like huge go down with just like print stuff right it's not printed but it's handwritten but still on paper so it's it somewhere has a record Yeah no i mean i think uh, on that lens let me tell you like uh, one so there's a set of like uh, it's a suit of 142 aquatins uh, which was uh, commissioned uh, i think by the queen these are uh, british artists uh, thomas and william daniel right and uh, that particular suit is the earliest record of india uh, which has been published these brothers cousins who visited india they've produced these 142 uh, suit individual works which are again editioned into whatever numbers right up until 1800s when the photography as a technique was in, invented that was the only painted picture of india mm. so you know that's how india was perceived in the west so i think print has its own fair share like in you know in terms of Uh, establishing certain ideas or painting a landscape to someone you know far in the ocean and things like that yeah yeah i did an episode with uh, on on uh, map uh, how a boundary is designed and stuff like that yeah uh, and it's it's fascinating because that's also form of like putting a special sort of design on a paper yeah. and that becomes pretty much a reference point for everyone how it is uh, how the country looks or how the geography is shaped and where is the ocean so yeah it's just like endless print hai to sab kuch hai types <laughs> no it's 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 definitely <clears throat> endless in fact you know actually if you this particular example what i gave you about thomas and william daniel you know they are not just mere painted pictures anymore you know if you retrospect on them if you really look at them you know they become a site of study for like you know recording history ethnographic studies you know uh, what is a painting you know what is a visual language there are these documents which carry these sort of substantial information like you know one can endlessly sit and mull about 
right? Mm. I mean, unlike our newspaper, what we get today in a Belpuri shop, uh, you know, it's like it's just been rolled up and, you know, it's always contested in that, that sense. Mm. Mm. Cool. Uh, I think I have like a couple of more questions. Um, so if you can quickly touch upon what are the different types of printing or yeah, printing, I would keep it very focused. Yeah. Uh, say like lithography or or like any any different varieties or are they categorized in a particular order or is it just like a flat so, list of yeah. techniques? No, I mean, see, each individual who practices printmaking, it's a technique in his own right, his or her own right, right? But uh, largely print has these uh, grand pigeonholes or brackets or whatever we would like to call them. In terms of techniques, again, it's a very material intensive or oriented thing right so it starts with relief printing relief printing is a bracket where it's like lino cut wood cut block printing you know whatever a reverse image reverse is the constant in every other printing technique unless it's an offset printing where it's been deliberately uh, you know i'll explain that in some time yeah. but uh, so relief printing is basically as as the title suggests it's like you're making an impression from a relief from a high surface so mm -hmm. that's one category uh, relief printing is where you sort of knock out or take away the negative areas you mm -hmm. know the unwanted areas you don't want these things to be printed Right? Mm -hmm. If you take, if you just take a piece of wooden slab and you roll up some ink to it and you put it into pressure, you will get just a black patch. Oh. Now, in that, if you want to sort of create a design, it's basically actually a design, right? Mm -hmm. So, if you want to create a design, you knock out where the ink should not hit the surface of the paper. You carve out you know, yeah. physically. So that's yeah. relief printing. Later, as we got our hands into newer materials and copper as a material was found and, you know, all of that, uh, there is a mega umbrella. It's called Intaglio with a G. Uh, Intaglio is a technique where it works a little, it's like opposite to relief printing, where mm. what you do is you force the ink into the negative areas or what you do is you carve your design into a block and you put your ink into it. And you make sure there is no ink on the surface. Hmm. And you okay. re run it through an etching press. Uh, it's a machine exerting a lot of pressure. So, And then there is a paper which is dampened. And the paper which is dampened, which is soft in its state, it will go all the way into the pits or the crevices, what you have carved in. And it will pick up that information from there. And then you get a impression out of it. So what God. falls in intaglio, like you have dry points, you have etchings. You have engravings, you know. Embossing. Embossing. Most of these, they fall into intaglio, you know, mm -hmm. technique. Mm -hmm. So after uh, intaglio, you know, again, the next one uh, logically coming is you neither cut nor you carve in. Uh, you, you barely do anything to a surface, which is lithography. Lithography is a name suggested. Uh, litho means stone and graph is like you're making a graph from a stone, right? Lithography. So basically, it started with a particular stone, which is limestone, and it still remains with that, which has a lot of pores in it. Right? Lithography uh, is also broadly called as planography. Yeah. Mm. Third major umbrella, as I was suggesting, um, it's I mean, as I was sharing, uh, it's planography, and uh, under planography, it's lithography, and it's basically a technique where you neither carve or nor dig to produce an image. What you do is. Um, you basically employ a basic science, which is water and oil repel, right? And uh, limestone is the stone usually which was used, uh, you know, when, when it was invented. And limestone in, a, in its nature has a lot of pores, you know. And uh, you take a piece of wax or a greasy material and you draw on the piece of stone and the rest of the area, you treat it with water, right? And when you charge ink on, on, on the stone, Whatever area you have drawn with a waxy material, ink and ink, they get attracted and the ink will go and get, you know, attached to the image which has been drawn on the stone. And uh, the negative areas are kept safe or white because there's water. Water repels the ink. So, you know, uh, that's the basic technique. And uh, yeah, of course, today it's gone to an extent where it's so sophisticated that, you know, we can't even comprehend the speed of it. Uh, all our offset printing, uh, the term offset, it's, it's actually, again, an accident. 
a German American while printing uh, a lithograph uh, misplaced a paper and he printed back onto a blanket like a, th there's a material a rubber uh, you know blanket on the press right so it got printed on the blanket and then he placed a paper and pulled a print from the blanket so essentially it was offset the ink was offset it went to rubber from stone and then it came back to paper vis-a-vis -vis lithographs or any other printing techniques are printed directly from the matrix right if there is a, a wooden block you put a paper and you pull a print from the matrix you don't transfer it to some other material and you bring it back again to paper yeah oh, so, so that was an accident and then he realized when uh, in that accident that you know prints made in this way are much more crisper and he could control the amount of ink um you know so that's how offset printing started but mm. you know an interesting piece to this is it was still limited into black and white or if you needed color it was always under the two color or three color yeah it, it was always an artist who had to come and like you know work around or a, uh, or a serious craftsman who had to work you know on this later in, in the early 1800s uh, when the photography was also invented there was a dire need to reproduce photographs right mm. how do you reproduce a photograph because what we understand today as a photograph is not a photograph. What I mean by that is if we look at into in our computer, whatever we have shot from our phones, they're images. They're not photographs. Okay, mm. let me explain. A photograph was something where you make a graph of light, right? You print. So like if you look at our uh, earliest forms of photography printing techniques, like developing a negative, and then there was this thing called contact printing, enlarger printing. So it's all coming from a physical material, right? And there was a limitation to that. Now, people wanted to sort of reproduce these images and put it into information like newspaper or any other paraphernalia, right? So there comes a serious English inventor, uh, William Fox Talbot, who, who sort of came up with this idea of splitting an image into tiny bits of dots. You know, as a, at the start of this conversation, I was telling you there is a dot of ink and there is no ink. So that's popularly, that's called half tone printing. Right? Mm. That's when you could break an image into series of dots and then you can control those dots through etching a plate and then you can print a photograph from that. A photograph is different from a print of a photograph. That's what I was trying to tell. Right. So, but then well, what happens when you're developing that negative? What is happening there? See, when you develop a negative, so what you do is you capture an image in a negative, right? Mm -hmm. And you go back to your dark room and you process that negative. And once the processing of the negative is done, what you do is you get into a series of techniques, which is like either printing it from contact, where you keep that negative on your photosensitive paper and you make an image from it, right? Or you enlarge it through an enlarger and make it, right? You can make hundreds of prints of that mm. with that technique, okay? But you cannot integrate that into a photo mechanical process like a printing, like newspaper. How will you do that? You can't do that. Because in a dark room, if you want a print, you need a highly sensitive paper, which is very mm. expensive, right? You cannot make a newspaper out of a highly photosensitive paper. Mm. Right. So there was a gap to bridge. You, you had to bring that image into a popular or a mainstream or a commercially viable, you know, space. So that's when half tone printing came in. And later that was appropriated for a particular uh, field of study. I mean, color is, it's a ocean, it's own, right? Uh, today, uh, we've, you know, a lot of people, when we say offset, they say, ha ha, humko pata hai, CMYK, CMYK, CMYK. <laughs> what is CMYK? Basically, CMYK is these series of half tones, which are split it into four parts. The cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, right? And all these four colors come together. They don't mix. They just come together. They sit next to each other to create an illusion of a full spectrum of, of a photograph for us. If, for example, uh, right after this conversation, if you have a magnifier and you go back and look at a newspaper image, you will be shocked. It's not a photograph. It's a series of dots, nothing else. 
Yeah. You know, our visual sense is not so sharp. You know, we assume a lot of things in perception. <laughs> wow, fascinating. Yeah. I think I yeah, I mean it's it's an endless exploration of exploratory journey but yeah. Too. Cool, I think um and the last one sorry and the uh, sorry the last yeah, one in yeah, Kumbhala is uh, screen printing or or serigraphy. Oh, I thought screen printing was part of that etching process. No, no. It's a different technique in its own right, although it's the first ever printing technique even before woodcut. But, mm-hmm. you know, these are the four broad categories of printing. Yeah. So if you want to just like tell about screen printing because I wish to do that. I mean, basically, soon. screen printing was never screen printing. It was serigraphy. It's basically you use a piece of silk cloth, stretch it to a wooden frame and you cover the parts in the cloth where you don't want ink and wherever you want, you let the cloth be as is and you force the ink through that. It's basically a stencil printing technique. Hmm. And later in the day, in uh, in 1930s, when nylon as a material was invented, um, you know, silk screen was replaced by nylon, and hence it it became screen printing, and the term serigraphy was taken away from them. Hmm. So, is, uh, yeah. why is it then? Why is it sort of? I I don't know. It's a personal inclination, but it feels much more warmer. It it you you have a more tactile feeling to it as opposed to others, or am I not exposed Total. to others? All printmaking techniques are tactile, and, and uh, you, uh, I mean, etching is complicated uh, if you compare to silk screen, or if you come, or lithography is much more complicated to any of these techniques. So it depends hmm. on what is the image. See, what has happened is, uh, I think fundamentally, what we have to understand is these broader classifications. They have come by the virtue of us inventing newer techniques. You know, refining things over time. Today, we have the time to look back at it and categorize and say, oh, this is this, this is that, this is that. But it all happened in, in a particular, you know, uh, line. You know? Mm. Uh, so there is that involved in that too. So, <laughs> yes, yes. So any sort of thought, which parts of India did printing start first? I mean, uh, I hear, again, different narratives, Goa mein, like it came first. And then what is again your reading of it? Like, no, I any- mean, We've been told, and I think uh, that stands by and large as true, the first ever printing press was set up in Goa, right? Mm-hmm. And, but there was always, as I said, uh, uh, there was always intentions to it, right? And mm-hmm. to to sort of like popularize or, or, or disseminate certain religious or certain ideologies and things like that. But I think uh, after Goa, a lot of places in India which got picked and probably they're quite marginalized in history, like Tamil Nadu, like in Chennai, there was a lot of printing press, which Varnasi, in fact, was one of the printing hub back in the days, right? Mm-hmm. And all sorts. Of, and, uh, you know, having these machines was a luxury back in the days, right? Mm-hmm. You know, if you have one of these machines, it's it's like you have Google in your hands, like you can do whatever yeah. you want to do. And of course, access to paper, which was also expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so uh, printmaking as such, uh, of course, like it, it took a serious blow um, uh, with a couple of people. Like, if you look at um, the modernists or, 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 or if you look at the Bengal school, you know, there was uh, Vindranath Tagore, there was Nandalal Bose, who were like the pioneers to adapt these things and, you know, in their own practice and make uh, copies of it or print. And in, in fact, Calcutta is still renowned as a printing capital in the country, like the uh, Chitpur. Right? Mm, you know, mm, if you mm. go there, you will find all sorts of printing techniques, whatever we will, through the history, you know, through the timeline, whatever we are talking, they're still operational. People are still working with those techniques there. Right? And of course, there is uh, Raja Ravi Varma, uh, who had his own fair share. He sort of like, you know, his one of his friends suggested that, why don't you popularize your paintings, you know, using print. And he picked that up idea and he invited a German again to, uh, you know, a Lonawala. They set up this press and then the first chromolithograph was ever printed in the country right yeah. so i mean it's also interesting suddenly a layman which again is the word you used could access to a raja ravi varma i, th- I think it was a, a revelatory thing yeah yeah in fact i i interviewed uh, manu pille and we have documented some bits of raja ravi varma and yeah. where he spoke about like how his fascination to be more famous and more glorious and sort of the 
Raja Ravi Verma of India. But uh, it's just it, it's, it, it's just not that. Unfortunately, it has a lot of other you know connotations to it, which yeah, probably yeah. sometimes we might not have the time or bandwidth to sit. Like you know, there are a lot of religious or nationalistic approaches or connotations Correct, yeah. around yeah, these yeah, yeah. You know, in specific things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely, there's no sort of one reason for one event to occur. Like it's it's just that. it's the narrative that comes to us but there are like maybe thousand reasons for that one thing to happen for say raja ravi verma even to move around india like what was the reason yeah the many many layers to it true, true. cool like before concluding just second last question uh, if you can give very quick brief uh, landscape uh, because now with instagram i am just following a lot of print makers and and uh, people who are into like real paper print mostly at least whom i follow are outside india so how is sort of the landscape in india and outside india because we have such rich art and culture background but we hardly use paper we hardly understand that the fifth iteration of a of a lino cut has got like more refinedness to it as opposed to first right yeah. we are not being sensitive to that uh, any any sort of Yeah, I mean, I Your think I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna end up uh, in trouble if I start talking about it. But so I'm I'm just gonna keep it loose and large in this particular context. It's not that there is still a, like holding a technique and not sharing with anyone, or you know, I don't understand that. I think that was the spark of like you know starting an open space to have these dialogues and 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 allowing access to people who are interested or inclined towards printmaking. right and uh, uh, in terms of a larger scene or the contemporary print making scene i think there are a lot of things which are happening in the country like for example um, you know there's an organization called chap print making studio in baroda right mm-hmm. uh, uh, there are 20 role organization right or or for the fact like in bombay there is a, a, a i mean i don't know how to even categorize this um, um there is uh, pritam arts right who have a legacy of 30 years of screen printing mm mm-hmm. it they, they might not be working in the fine art or the artist space for 30 years but i'm i'm sure they will catch up and they will be there like you know and or or for the matter of fact if uh, i mean come on who who doesn't celebrate diwali in the country right all this while we have burned so many crackers all the paraphernalia around you know it's all in shivkashi right it's the printing capital any film poster you know uh, up until the advent of offset printing any film poster was printed in shivkashi right mm. it's it's also very interesting to look at these practices and you know where they stem from how you know a lot of people find livelihoods for a lot of people it's it's joy exploring a material or looking at you know refining a fifth layer or a fifth edition in the lino cut you know as you were suggesting mm. right so <laughs> so it's difficult but there are definitely a, a lot of people who are invested and who are working towards you know uh, continuing or keeping these practices alive that's very much there yeah uh, uh, there's some ray of hope cool so what's the future what according to you you have been sort of contemplating and thinking and speculating uh, i'm sure you must be like undergoing through a lot of churn as well in your mind but what what how do you envision future of print in india with now uh, oil yeah struggling to survive paper being challenged with eco friendly karna hai <laughs> yeah. uh, no uh, i think in fact uh, with the consequence of the recent uh, gapla with russia and things like that Yeah. Uh, you know in fact we are all struggling like for example uh, you know there's this particular paper which is used in packaging t-shirts or shirts right when we buy a brand new shirt there's a card slipped in in a shirt it's called yeah. a duplex board mm. it's a duplex board is like a recycled board a material mm. earlier uh, it was like 8 rupees but uh, i don't think one has to be afraid of it because uh, there is a tangible aspect to it it's not just the value of it but you know you can still touch it feel it romanticize you can think about it and there is labor you know as long as labor is involved in it i think it is there to stay yeah yeah who yeah. can sort of survives test of time and in 2000 i don't know maybe like 80 someone in metaverse is listening to this and think <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
well i mean i also hope that um, i didn't end up in you know <laughs> trouble saying <laughs> <laughs> but you yeah. know it's, it's it's a contested space of course it's definitely a contest i mean yeah. um, who has the is a question right put them into a framework and say ha this is how it works or this is how, you know they, i mean in the next podcast you talk to someone else they might give you a different version of the print history in, in you know and then and I, i i think when before we conclude or you know anything as such uh i one thing always reminds me in my mind is i think uh, the systems and the need to communicate was, was was is the quintessential thing for these kind or print making or you know print making especially right mm. um and as long as we have that need uh, i think it will survive and it will find its own course and yeah we we as an organization at layer prati three of us we are trying to make an you know to provide that access to people you know who don't have that access to such infrastructure and yeah <laughs> there are many other people who are doing it. and also as you know we also make infrastructure for artists like we make affordable infrastructure for artists uh, i think in bangalore there are 25 independent studios who have access to their own etching presses right we ourselves have built that you know it could be an institute or it could be an artist individual studio but people are still willing to use this technique i think there is hope in that for sure absolutely i mean yeah like all all power to this and it's very very inspiring Yes. and and uh, yeah hope at clear prati sort of gives access because the students can then read odia and then you can really print books in odia so a well good design typeface from there they, yeah. i think i have some uh, some uh, some dots which now if i connect uh, i think that that's also creating a lot of value to understand how every aspect of print or every aspect of whatever comes to you in format so many layers to it True. Uh, like i mean in fact um, anecdote to it you know uh, lithography in our country still survives because of urdu up until uh, the computer and 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 all these uh, type softwares uh, came into point there's no still uh, urdu type by the way uh, you know we got it post 60s when we hit the whole uh, soft type or a cold yeah. type which is like working with computer and whatever so mm-hmm. lithography is still in parts of hyderabad in fact i think at least prati got uh, we got our uh, lithographic presses from a very old printing place in hyderabad chatta bazaar and it was there was a urdu press which was going to you know shut shop and we sort of went there and you know negotiated with them and picked it up from them yeah so yeah there are these things you know it's 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 give and take always yeah. as i yeah. said it's the literacy systems which which evoke the entire need of all these things and uh, yeah <laughs> cool cool yeah, i think these are these are endless conversations i am just going to come and meet you at atlier prati very soon for okay. this episode right. i think i think we'll conclude for now uh, yeah. it was great talking to you thanks for sharing your wonderful insights and i uh, hope uh, the listeners get some more sort of uh, curiosity build as to like kya hai kya like <laughs> in this digital world right so thanks thanks uh, once again uh, for being on the show thank you kedar and that's it from today's gyan session for show notes and more gyan visit audiogyan.com if you like this podcast please don't forget to check our other interesting podcast on ivm network you can listen to us on ivm podcast app ivmpodcast.com or any of your favorite podcasting apps to stay tuned follow us on twitter and instagram at ivm podcast and if you wish to connect with me i am at audiogan moments on instagram until then take care there's a quick survey to fill out on ivmpodcast.com/survey It lets us know a little bit more about who's listening to us, and you know what? We're gonna do a few prizes. So I mean, like, we'll do a random drawing of like maybe ten people, and we'll send you all some swag. Remember, that's ivmpodcast.com/survey where you can fill out the survey. Don't you think that if everyone around you is getting smart, you better be smarter? Hey there, I'm the traveling professor Siddharth Deshmukh, and I'm back with season two of my podcast to make you smarter, smarter with Sid. What's this season's focus about? Well, it's about 10-minute nuggets that will make you stand out at work. 
It's time to go from smart to smarter. Tune in every Tuesday and Thursday and become smarter with Sid.